find the reading on uh, page 1186 of the Bibles in the back of the chairs. That's page 1186. And it's Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Graham. Uh, please do keep your Bibles open in front of you. And uh, just before I begin in earnest, I just want to say something, because if I don't say it now, it'll probably be hanging in your minds for the rest of it. Remember, women especially, where it says, wives, submit to your husband, yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord, read the verse before it, okay? Which says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So just want to get that out of the way now, because otherwise... It'll be in your minds for the next however long. Okay, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. The psalmist says that the unfolding of your word gives light, and so we pray that your light would stream into our hearts this morning. We pray that you would take my lips, that you would speak through them to your people who are gathered here this morning that we may be bathed in the radiant light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus. We ask this in his name and for his praise. Amen. Amen. Well, since Pentecost, we've been looking at different ways that the New Testament describes the church in order to try and recover a truly biblical understanding, a biblical vision of what it means to be the church. We've seen that the church is described as being conceived by the Spirit, as living stones, as a countercultural community, as uh, God's family, as the body of Christ, as God's army. And today we come to the image of the church as the bride of Christ. And it's an image that the ch- uh, of the church. It doesn't just appear here in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, but it's also on the lips of Jesus himself in all four Gospels and in the book of Revelation. In fact, the image of the church as the bride of Christ is on the very last page of the Bible. The church, desperate for her wedding day, 
crying out with the Spirit, come! And if the church is the bride, then Christ is the groom to whom we're betrothed and whose appearance we eagerly await. Now there's something about marriage as the loving, faithful, lifelong and committed union of one man and one woman that the Bible says is a picture of the relationship between Christ and the church. Marriage is a wonderful thing. It's a gift of God in creation. But as we read in this passage today, it's absolutely clear that marriage is not an end in itself for husband and wife to enjoy merely as a private possession. Rather, marriage is meant to point towards Jesus. It's meant to point towards his love for his people. Uh, just look, look with me again, the, the, the last couple of verses of this passage. Paul says, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Did you get that? It's not first about marriage and then about Jesus. It's about Jesus and then about us. That's really important. Chris C. uh, writes uh, in a, a marriage preparation book that he's written, God's purpose in marriage transcends simply ensuring uh, the couple's long, happy life together. God is singular in his purpose that in every aspect of their life, through the highs and lows, through ordinary and extraordinary moments, it is for the revelation of God's glory. Marriage is never just about the couple it's about Jesus that's what Paul says here now I suspect that uh, there might be quite a few people here this morning who feel uh, a bit uncomfortable with the talk of the church as the bride of Christ I imagine could be wrong but I, I strongly suspect that quite a few of the men for starters might feel a little bit uncomfortable with this imagery um And if you are, then just remember that Paul wrote this under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Uh, It's for the whole church, men and women. Uh, God knew what he was doing this by putting this in our Bibles. Uh, Often, uh, you will have noticed that there's quite a lot of masculine imagery in the Bible. For example, about adoption to sonship and stuff like that. And this is a bit of a counterbalance to that. And another reason why some people might feel uh, a little uncomfortable with this imagery is because they kind of think it might smack of uh, a kind of over-emotional, syrupy, Jesus is my boyfriend kind of spirituality. Um, And I want to say to you two things. First, you're, you're, you're absolutely right that it's the church, not individual believers, who are called the bride of Christ. Uh, but second, we don't just worship God with our minds. We worship him with our hearts. And this metaphor of the church uh, as the bride of Christ powerfully reminds us of that. So then, uh, the question is, what is it about marriage that lends itself as an image for the relationship between Christ and the church? Well, first it should be said that the, the, the sacred marriage motif isn't a New Testament invention. It goes back, uh, it's in the Old Testament, in passages, in books uh, like Hosea and Isaiah and Ezekiel, uh, which describe God's relationship to Israel as that of a husband and wife. Uh, In fact, there's a a rich vein of interpretation, both Jewish and Christian, that has read the entire book of the Song of Songs as a love poem between God and his people. Uh, And so this image of God's people, first Israel, then the church, as his bride, has really deep, deep biblical roots. And so there are three things in particular that Paul says uh, to help us better understand the church that I want to just try and draw out for us today. First, Christ's love for the church. Second, Christ's responsibility towards the church. And third, Christ's identification with the church. So first, Christ's love for the church. The image of the church as the bride of Christ is first and foremost meant to remind us of the fact that's at the heart of our faith. 
that Christ, Jesus loves us and has set his affections on us. Who are we as the church? We are loved. We are loved. Before we love, we are loved. That's what it says in 1 John. Uh, we love because he loved us first. We are loved. Do you know that? I don't mean know it up here. Do you know it in here? We are loved. To be church is to know that we are loved by Jesus. Uh, once, towards the end of uh, his long career, uh, the great Swiss theologian Karl Barth, who's probably the, the greatest theologian of the 20th century, uh, was asked whether he could sum up his most important theological ideas in just a few words. He thought for a moment, smiled, and then he said, yes, in the words of a song my mother used to sing to me, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And therefore, if there's nothing else that you remember from this sermon today, please remember this, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Okay? Can we have a deal? I hope you, will, might, you might remember something more, but I'm setting my standards pretty low, okay? Um, he loves all who belong to him through faith. He loves you. He loves me. It sounds so simple, yet to know it, to truly know it as the deepest truth from which we live is life-changing. You know, there's a, uh, uh, some words with the, the, right at the beginning of the Song of Songs. Uh, and uh, there, was a, there, there was a theologian called Bernard of Clairvaux in the Middle Ages, and he spent ages looking at the Song of Songs. In fact, I think he wrote something like 800 sermons on the Song of Songs and didn't get past chapter 2. And verse 2 of the first, uh, the first verse says, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. And Bernard of Clairvaux meditated on this. And he meditated. And he meditated. What does this mean? And where he came to was, what is a kiss but experienced love? Not just hearing something, but experiencing something. And that is what Jesus wants for us, not merely to, to know his love as an idea, but to know it as a kiss upon our lips. The deepest truth from which we live. Jesus, the Son of God, the image of the invisible God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the eternal word of the Father loves you. Isn't that amazing? You don't look very amazed. You should. It's incredible. And how do we know that he loves you? Well, we know because Paul says he gave himself up for her. You know, it's been said many times before that you can, love, uh, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Christ demonstrates his love for the church in giving himself up for her entirely. Complete surrender, without reserve, holding nothing back. If you want to know the love of Jesus, that cross is where you need to look. That tells you everything. When bride and groom exchange rings in the marriage service, they say these words to each other. With my body, I honor you. All that I am, I give to you. And all that I have, I share with you. If we understand the image of the church as the bride of Christ in a purely kind of fluffy, romantic kind of way, we've got it dead wrong. Because despite what you see in the movies, that's not what love is. Love is about complete self-giving for one another. And often it's not romantic at all. Often it's incredibly painful. 
a few years ago. Uh, I was at a friend's church, and uh, they were talking about this passage, uh, and there was an image they had. I've tried looking for it, and I haven't been able to find it. But it's a, an image of Christ's crown of thorns, and in the center of that crown of thorns are the words, with this ring, I thee wed. And it's still embedded in my mind, and I wish I could have found a, a, a copy of it. But here is a, a wedding ring that far exceeds any gold ring that might be given. That far exceeds the preciousness of any diamond that you could put on it. Jesus, the king of the universe, came into the world 2,000 years ago to betroth to himself a bride at the price of his own blood. And that also means he'll come again to marry her and to take her to be with him forever. And so the kind of love that bride and groom promise to one another till death do them part, Christ promises to the church. Except Christ will never be parted from us by death. And we never parted from him by death. That's what Jesus says uh, to, uh, to, to, to Mary and Martha when he raises Lazarus. Those who believe in me will never die. The words that a bride and groom say to each other on their wedding day, Jesus says to those who belong to him, with my body I honor you, all that I, ha I am I give to you, and all that I have I share with you. Isn't that incredible? Can you believe that we are loved with a love like that. Christ died for love of our love, to woo us, to win us to himself. Christ came into the world to be loved. And therefore, there can be nothing more basic to the church's sense of its own identity, of its own self, than love for Jesus. A church that isn't in love with Jesus isn't the church. It doesn't matter what kind of a building you meet in. It's not the church if you don't love Jesus. And a large part of my job, I think, my understanding of it from reading the scriptures is, as Paul said, to present you as a bride to one husband, even Christ. And so I think my job is to stir up among us love for Jesus. Because you don't belong to me. This church doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to you either. You belong to Jesus. We've got a wedding day to look forward to. And I want us looking the part for it. Which leads us on to the second part of the marriage metaphor that points us towards the relationship between Christ and the church. And that's Christ's responsibility towards her. So Paul says this, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Christ has reconciled us to God through his body on the cross. He has borne our sins in his body on the cross. The cross is the ultimate expression of what it means for a husband to honor a wife with his body. It is a life completely laid down for her, physically as well as emotionally. But there's more, because Christ gave himself up for the church to make her holy, to cleanse her, and to bring out her true beauty. In other words, to give her, to give us everything that he has, to share with her, with us, everything he is. Did you know that the word Christian only occurs three times in the entire Bible? Rather, the way that the New Testament tends to talk about believers is that they are people who are in Christ. So these words, or their equivalent, in him, appear 216 times in Paul's letters, 
and a further 26 times in the Gospel and Letters of John. And so the theologian Paul Murray claims that nothing is more central or more basic than union and communion, communion with Christ. He argues that union with Christ is the central truth of salvation. And J.I. Packer, um, a great, uh, great man of God, says much the same thing. He says, communion between God and man is the end to which both creation and redemption are the means. It is the goal to which both theology and preaching must ever point. It is the essence of true religion. It is indeed the definition of Christianity. The image of marriage, the two becoming one, is a fundamental pointer that our ultimate goal is to be united with Jesus. To be one with Jesus. If you are in Christ, then everything that he has and everything he is, is yours. Martin Luther writes... Who can understand the riches of the glory of this grace? Here is this rich and divine bridegroom, Christ, marries this poor, wicked harlot, redeems her from all her evil, and adorns her with all his goodness. Her sins cannot now destroy her, since they are laid upon Christ and swallowed up by him. And she has that righteousness in Christ, her husband, of which she may boast of as her own, and which she can confidently display alongside her sins in the face of death and hell, and say, if I have sinned, Yet my Christ in whom I believe has not sinned, and all his is mine, and all mine is his. Do you understand what that means? We now share everything. We have a joint bank account. And all the debts that we have, he takes upon himself. And all the riches of his grace is now at our disposal. And let me tell you something. There is more grace than there is debt. Wow. Wow. A husband's primary responsibility towards his wife isn't to make her happy, but to make her holy. In September, uh, it will be 12 years since Angie and I got married. I should have remembered it's actually 12 years today since uh, Tom and Sean got married, so congratulations. Um, I'm sure it's probably true for you as well, Tom, but I can still remember exactly what Angie looked like when, uh, when she was walking down the aisle to meet me in the church uh, that day. And she looked stunning. And for the record, speaking to camera, she still does look stunning. <laughs> Her hair was immaculate, her skin glowed, her dress was beautiful and elegant, she was radiant. No bride ever looks a mess on their wedding day. No matter what they might say, they never look a mess on their wedding day. You know, I've taken lots of funerals uh, in, 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 in my time. No bride looks a mess on their wedding day. And Christ, Paul says, is not only the groom, but he's the beautician. He presents the church to himself as a radiant church. Radiant. The Greek word endoxon means something closer to glorious. No bride turns up in rags on her wedding day. And that's not how Jesus is going to marry us either. Jesus has given everything that we might radiate his holiness. He wants us to glow. John Stott writes, on, on earth the church is often in rags and tatters, stained and ugly, despised and persecuted, but one day she'll be seen for what she is, nothing less than the bride of Christ. And so not only has Christ betrothed us to himself by paying the price for us in his blood, but he also provides his own holiness to be our wedding dress so that he might present us to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish. 
Paul says that Christ gave himself up to make us holy, but also to present us to himself as holy. And so just a, a quick question here, how can, we be bo- how can we both be holy and also need to be made holy? Uh, Rankin Wilborn explains, in the Bible, holiness is both what we already are and what we're called to become. Uh, it's as if God says, I've set you apart, now live like it. I've made you holy, now be holy. I've redeemed you and set you free, now live as free people, not as slaves. It's done. Now do it. It's, it's like um, kind of the way that you might have a, a, a bank account for a child. And they can't access it straight away, but that money is in their name. It's theirs. And they have to grow into it. And they will grow into it. And it will become fully theirs. And they will take possession of it. Now, that's an imperfect analogy, but hopefully you get the point. If we're going to live out our identity as the bride of Christ, we must pursue that holiness that says we belong to Jesus. We must practice wearing the wedding wedding dress day after day until it fits. And if there's a bride, then that means there's a wedding. Christ is getting us, his church, ready for that day when he returns and we'll be joined together so as never to be put asunder. He's washed us through repentance and faith, sealed in baptism. He's making us holy and one day he will present us to himself as our true selves, as humans who are fully alive in God, just as God intended us to be from the beginning. But though the wedding day still lies ahead, We experience something of our union with Christ now. Just as an engagement ring is uh, the uh, the token of a promise to marry in the future, so here and now we know something of what it is to be one with Christ in anticipation of the wedding day itself. And so that's the third and final aspect of marriage which Paul says helps us understand the relationship between Christ and the church. Christ's identification with her. Just as husband and wife become one flesh, so Paul says Christ and his church become one body. Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, Paul says. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, people, who have, never ha- people have never hated their own bodies, but they feed and care for them, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. The image of the church as the bride of Christ is an image of Christ's total identification with her. And we see this uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, for instance. So uh, where Saul, later Paul, uh, persecutor in chief of the Christians, is knocked off his donkey as he's on his way to Damascus to round up some Jesus followers. And what does the risen Jesus say to him? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting those Christians over there? No, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He identifies with his bride totally. To persecute his bride is to persecute him. Christ has bound himself so fully and so freely to the church that it should be inconceivable to have one without the other. You can't do Jesus without the church as much as we might sometimes want to, and neither can you do church without Jesus, though some seem to be trying. Yet this should be a cause for great hope to us, because Christ cares for us as he cares for himself. To be the bride of Christ means that we're meant to enjoy an intimate relationship with him. You and I are created for an intimate relationship with God through Christ. And so in in verse 31, Paul quotes from Genesis 2, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Then he goes on, This is a profound mystery. 
but I'm talking about Christ and the church. So don't you see that, that Christ's relationship to the church isn't a picture of marriage. Rather, marriage is a picture of Christ's relationship to the church. Uh, Marshall Seagal explains, marriage exists to tell us that we need Jesus. It's a living exposition of Christ's relentless and passionate pursuit of his chosen people, the church, and of the church's restless ache for him. He would not rest until he had her. She would not rest until she had been found by him. The two will become one flesh. And Paul tells us that this is not primarily about husband and wife, but primarily about Christ and the church. And John Piper says this, he says, King Jesus came into the world to take a wife, not a harem, not for sex, but to give her pleasures that make sex taste like cardboard. He paid for her with his life, and he is now at work by his spirit and his word, purifying and beautifying her for himself and for her joy. Now, I'm sure you've probably noticed it. It's hard not to. But our culture is somewhat, uh, how do we say, obsessed with sex. It's everywhere. And Paul is saying that the experience of intimacy with Jesus is better than sex. Infinitely better. And that's good news. I think that's good news whether you're married, whether you're single. It's good news because Christ is our true husband. And marriage, as wonderful as it is, is appointed to something so much greater it's meant, it's given on almost page one of the Bible. And, it, and there's a picture of marriage on the, end, uh, the last page of the Bible. Because it's a pointer to something beyond itself. And the marriage that we have between Christ and the church is a marriage that will never end. Now I know uh, there will be a lot of people here today who are carrying wounds of different kind around marriage, perhaps because you've never been married, and that's something that hurts. Perhaps because um, you, you, you've desperately wanted to be married, and it's never happened. Perhaps some of you here today um, have had bad experiences of marriage, or uh, you've been divorced, you're in the middle of divorce, or you've, uh, you, you've watched close family members or friends go through divorce. I can only imagine the amount of pain that there is in this room because of marriage uh, going wrong in some way, or not happening. But I believe that the Bible's teaching about the permanent, unbreakable character of marriage is good news because is meant to demonstrate that Christ's uh, commitment to us is unequivocal. As we sang earlier on, his love never fails, never gives up, he never runs out on us. No matter what our experiences of marriage have been, whether good, bad, or non-existent, to know the love of Christ is to know the meaning of marriage. And to anyone here who's carrying wounds from marriage or singleness today, let me just say this as clearly as I can. There is more grace in Jesus than hurt and brokenness in us. And it is precisely hurting, broken people like you and me that Jesus is dead set on presenting to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So the biblical vision of marriage, the lives of husband and wife should be so tightly wrapped up with each other that you can't pull them apart. They're like two cords bound together, making up a single rope. Two become one. And if you've ever taken part in a three-legged race, Marriage is a little bit like that. It's difficult, often. You have to work together so that one, where one goes, both go. 
at a wedding, a husband and wife make promises to one another. They promise to love the other person and to carry on loving the other person. It's something I say at every wedding I do because it's something that we need to hear, which is a distinctively Christian way of understanding about marriage. No minister, at no time do I ever, when I'm conducting a marriage, say, do you love David? Do you love Janet? I ask, will you? Because it's a choice. It's an act of the will. It's not about whether you have warm, 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 fuzzy feelings for the other person now. That's great. I'm not, not saying that's not, but that won't get you through. It's a choice. They promise to love one another, to carry on loving one another, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. And Jesus makes this same promise to the church. He'll never leave us. He'll never walk out on us. He'll always stay beside us because he's made us part of his own life. He's committed to us. And so the question that that this calls forth from us, I think, is will we return those vows? And will we say to Jesus that we will love him for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer? in sickness and in health? Will you love him even if you never find a spouse, even if you never get married? Will you love him when you lose your job? Will you love him when you get cancer? Will you love him when your spouse dies of cancer? Marriage is, as Paul said, a profound mystery. For all our flaws and failings, Christ loves us and has demonstrated this love once and for all by giving up himself to death on the cross for us. Now, a few weeks ago, um, I quoted this uh, from Shelley, uh, the poet Shelley, who said, I could believe in Christ if he did not drag behind him his leprous bride, the church. But you know what? It's actually our spiritual leprosy that makes his love for us all the more incredible. (laughs) Because he doesn't love us because we're lovely. He loves us to make us lovely. (laughs) Therefore, though his love meets us where we are, he loves us too much to leave us where we are. Christ gave himself up for the church in order to make us, to make her as holy as he is. And Christ might have set his love on a leprous bride, as Shelley put it, but his love for us is healing us from the inside out, making us more fully human, more glorious, more radiant than we've ever been. And he'll see the job through because he doesn't want his bride looking a mess on his wedding day. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to just put before you the wonder of this for a moment. I just want, want to invite us just to take some time to marvel on this fact for a moment. Christ and the church are one body, one flesh. We are his and he is ours. The perfect son of God the king of the universe calls us his own. And we, fickle and broken and faithless sinners that we might be, get to call him ours. Can I just invite us just to take a moment, just in quiet, just to marvel on that grace. Lord Jesus, what what more can we say in response to all this? But thanks be to God. 
thank you that your love for us as your bride uh, is a deeper love than any we've ever experienced or any that we could ever experience from another human. Thank you that even the very, very best of marriages is but a pale and dim reflection of your love for us. We pray that you give us a de deeper experience of your fiery and jealous and passionate love for us so that uh, th that love that would not only kind of woo us as sinners but sanctify us and dress us with the beauty of your holiness that, makes, that will make us look a, a more radiant bride than any that has ever walked down an aisle in a church. And we ask you, Lord, to heal any wounds that there are in this room at the moment from failed or broken or difficult marriages for those who are carrying wounds of singleness and Lord for those who are married here today for those who are getting ready for marriage Lord I'm, I pray you would empower us to keep those promises of lifelong commitment to our spouse that the world may see in our marriages a picture of your perfect and extravagant covenant-keeping love for your people. So we pray that you captivate us once more with your love. Enthrall us, enrapture us, that we may be faithful to you till death. Not part us, but finally and fully unite us with you forever. Amen. So, as a way of uh, just responding to, uh, to, to, to God's words, I'm going to invite us into a, a time of confession now uh, that focuses on that image uh, of Jesus as our husband, as our green. So let's pray this prayer together. Jesus you have pursued us in love. Uh, uh, sorry, I've written that wrong. You have pursued us in love as your bride. But we confess that while you are always faithful, we have been unfaithful to you. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have turned from you, the lover of our souls. We have sought comfort in worldly pleasures neglecting the joy that can only be found in you. Have mercy on us, forgive us, and open our eyes that we may treasure you more than anything else and exult in your never-ending, unbreaking, always and forever love for us. Amen. So saints, you are the bride of Christ. In the cross and resurrection of Jesus, God has loved you with a pursuing and everlasting love. When he saw you dead in your sin, he called to you, live. He covered your nakedness with his righteousness and he made you his own. In Christ you are pursued, you are desired, and God is jealous for your heart. And we can be sure of this, that he who began a good work in us will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. We are the bride of Christ. Thanks be to God. So I'd like um, now to, to, to give us an opportunity to, to commit ourselves um, to Jesus. And so can I invite you to stand um, as we do this? Uh, and we're going to uh, use the uh, use words kind of adapted from the marriage service as a way of expressing our commitment to Jesus. So, I ask you, church, will you take Jesus Christ to be your husband, to love him with all your heart and to be faithful to him above all others? With the help of God, we will. And so let us pray this prayer to Jesus, a promise of our commitment to him. Lord Jesus Christ, as you have loved us and gave yourself up for us, that we might be made holy. So we give ourselves to you, holy and unreservedly, as a bride to her husband. 
for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death make our self-giving